Welcome to a TechSmith Camtasia Overview. I'm Ryan Carmichael, Web and Information Designer for Texas A&M Physics and Astronomy. If you're unfamiliar with Camtasia, it's a piece of software you can get for PC or Mac computers. You would have to purchase either a license for PC or Mac separately. You cannot have it for both, uh, both computers at once. I should also mention that you can use Camtasia on the blocker media computers because it's already been installed on those for us. It is best to use Camtasia to illustrate and or highlight sections of your screen in a webinar style format. What that means is on the user side they'll see you going through either a PowerPoint or a piece of software clicking through it as if they are participating with you in using the program and then you can provide voiceover or even your face via webcam to give this video a little bit more personality. So to get started, you just need to obtain a license via the TAMU Software Center. It's about $18. Let me quickly pull that up for you. So you can find this page at cell.tamu.edu slash forums. And if you go to the IT self-service website, you can find all kinds of other software, but we're looking for Camtasia slash Snagit. It should ask you to sign in via SSO. And once you're there, you can add this item to your cart and then go through the order process. Make sure that you select the correct uh, operating system. So if you're using PC or Windows, then select that. If you're using a Mac computer with OS X, then select Macintosh. Otherwise, you could end up with the wrong software here and you might have to repurchase it. So once you do purchase it, you should receive an email pretty shortly after with instructions on, on how to install it, how to, how to activate it via your activation key. All that's in the email. You get a link to download it. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Once it's installed, you're good to go. But I'll mention that you may be asked to create a TechSmith account in the process and once the program starts up you uh, should be asked to sign in with your TechSmith account. Another good thing about this account is it stores your activation keys so if you ever lose this email with all the information you can go and access your, old, your key and, and recover it. So once the program started up you should actually be given a nice tutorial um, how, how to get started in this program. And I'm just going to go ahead and play that for you because it's it's actually very well done and explains a few things in my place here. Welcome to Camtasia. This sample project will provide a quick tour and get you started. If you're looking for more in-depth tutorials that walk you through the entire process of recording, editing, and sharing your videos, check out the video tutorials on our website. And if you want to open a fresh copy of this sample project, you can find it in the Help menu. Right now, you're in the Camtasia Editor. The editor is made up of the timeline, where you can arrange and edit your clips, the canvas, which is your video preview, and the tools panel, where your media is stored, along with shapes, animations, effects, and more. At the top of the tools panel, there's a button to launch the Camtasia Recorder a tool that captures all of the action on your computer screen. When you're done recording, each clip will be placed in your media bin and on your timeline. If there are parts of your recording you don't need to show, you can trim them from the end or cut them from the middle. If you'd like to add other media, titles, or effects, drag them from the Tools panel to the Timeline. If you choose an effect, such as an animation or transition, the clips on the Timeline will highlight, showing you where it can be applied. While you're working on your project, use the Canvas to position your media and preview any edits you make. You can use the Properties panel to fine-tune your media and effects. 
such as positioning an object to an exact location, rotating an object, or even changing its scale and opacity. When you're satisfied with your video, export it as a file on your computer, share it to popular web destinations, or upload it to video review and invite your colleagues to review the video. So that did explain things as an overview. I'll get a little bit more in depth on some of those in just a little bit. So to just illustrate for you right down here, what he did earlier on was he cut part of the footage. And one of the most common things you'll have to do is cut the beginning or the end off your footage. So let me quickly show you how to do that. So you place your marker, that's this thing with a green and a red little icons next to it, where you want to make this cut. Then click and drag that green all the way left as far as you can. That's moving it to the beginning of this uh, entire project. Now you click this tiny little scissors and it cuts all that stuff away. And the same thing could be said for the end. So you, do, you want this video to end about a minute and 55 seconds. So move your marker and then move that little red icon. It should kind of lock to the end. You'll see kind of that yellow line saying, hey, this is snapping to the end. And same thing, click the scissors. So now that is quite a bit shorter than it was before. It gets rid of things that I don't want there anymore like prepping for my PowerPoint presentation and, and trying to tie things up at the end. You could even make cuts in the middle of your video, say same, same and similar process. So move your marker and then drag the red or the green uh, to how much you want to cut out of there. You use the scissors, bam, it's gone. You'll see kind of this uh, cross-hatching effect once it's cut stuff in the middle that means it's it's melded these two pieces together essentially so since I'm already recording in Camtasia I can't I can't show you how to record everything here but to do that there's the record button at the top left the previous speaker did mention that uh, before so the important thing to note with that is you do want to make sure that you're recording with a decent piece of equipment for capturing your voiceover so that's to say, if you're using a headset, try to use something with um, some noise cancellation, something that's, I don't know, I would say is intended for what you're trying to do, which is voiceovers for an online presentation. You could also ha get a webcam with a built-in microphone. Sometimes these, depending on the quality of the webcam, may sound quite a bit more muffled than a headset. So if all you plan to do is a voiceover, I would recommend a headset. But if you plan to have your face in there too, then okay, probably a webcam, but do not go for the lower end webcams. Try to get something uh, intended for online uh, video. So once you do want to record, there's three main um, resolutions that are pretty important. So video resolutions, if you're intending for this to go online, which you should be, there's some standards that are kind of already in place. So for YouTube, the minimum really is 1280 by 720p HD. That means, um, if you're familiar with TVs, for example, we, we actually don't have a lot of flat screen TVs that are in 1280 by 720p anymore. That's actually 10 to 15 years old of a standard. The standard nowadays is usually 1920 by 1080p. That is your standard HD TV that is on a lot of houses today. So if you played this video on your TV, you, you wouldn't have much loss of quality if you're using that resolution. The standard that is coming into, into effect nowadays is known as 4K or UHD. That's 3,840 pixels by 2,160 pixels. That's basically double the 1920 by 1080p and I think that's where the term 4K comes from. 4K is beautiful and it looks very clear on most uh, TVs today because not everybody even has a 4K TV. So 
if you're able to do 4K and you have the processing power in your computer, say you have a fairly newer computer, then you could probably pull this off. But if you're using an older laptop or something like that, you might have a lot of trouble trying to get 4K to work. So just stick with 1920 by 1080p to be safe. You may not have that exact resolution for your computer. I'm just saying to get as close as you can to these resolutions uh, because these are pretty much the standards. The next big thing to note is TAMU brand guidelines. You can go to the TAMU brand guidelines website, just Google TAMU brand guidelines and look for video best practices. It mentions a few things here which shouldn't really concern you because these are more for like interview videos. But the one that does stand out is captioning. So in compliance with the law, we are supposed to caption all our videos. I know we're in a pretty short time crunch right now trying to get these videos even up. But I, I'm saying this in the effort of we shouldn't just um, overlook it completely because you could do the video now and then add the captions on later. If you intend to use this video um, maybe next semester or something like that, then definitely think about closed captioning. Things that can help with that is providing a script um, or having a script to voice over the video can really help because then you can basically copy and paste parts of your script into the closed captions and save a lot of time. Camtasia has closed captions built in, but they're really not very useful, so I don't recommend them at all. There's also a speech to text in Camtasia, but it's also not very accurate. The best free tool I found for doing closed captions is, is YouTube. If you upload your videos to YouTube, it has an automatic closed captioning feature that is quite accurate. There are still some slip-ups, like if you use some more unfamiliar words or if you speak too quickly, then YouTube could have issues trying to translate that. Another thing that you may have to do is edit your audio. So find it in the timeline. You'll see some audio waveforms that go up and down. Right click it and go to edit audio. Then you should see this green kind of highlight effect. And at the top of it is a line that you can click and drag up or down to decrease or increase the volume. Another neat thing you could do is wherever you right click and your cursor is, you can go to add audio point and it adds this green dot and then add another one. Uh, let's say over here. And then you can drag these audio points wherever you want, up or down, left or right. And now it's actually going from uh, sort of a fade effect, from normal volume to no volume. That's one way to do that. You can also just undo everything by right-click it and delete all audio points on the media. Another thing I like to do is maybe use some things in the library. There's intros, outros, and all, all sorts of stuff you can use in here. But um, quickly I'll show you how, how some of these work. So you click it, drag it out of there and into your timeline. And now I've got this, uh, let me drag this back down. Now I've got this intro happening in my canvas area. And the problem I might run into is now I've overlaid it on top of my uh, talking tracks. So you can actually click and drag to highlight all those other tracks you want to move. And then once they're selected, you drag them over to the right. This allows the intro to play without those other things being affected. And then it'll go straight into the next part of the track. And then on the intro itself, you can actually double click and start um, affecting that pretty quickly. It's very easy to go in and change all this text. You're also given some features to change the text types and change the 
um, style of it, the size, all kinds of things. So it's pretty neat and it's really easy to use. It's important to note down here in the timeline, I have um, something called the line wipe. This is my intro itself. So I can go back to the timeline and that's where I see my audio track and things like that. And that happened because I double clicked the intro itself and so it, it had created another tab for it basically to where I can edit that independently. Now I'd love to show you a, another video that goes a little in depth on how to record your PowerPoint presentations or import the slides into Camtasia. It's actually really neat because it creates um, basically an asset for every slide in your PowerPoint and then you can record your voice on top of that. One is if you have Camtasia installed and you have PowerPoint on your machine, Camtasia actually includes an add-in up here in the top menu section of PowerPoint that gives you the Camtasia recording capabilities right within PowerPoint. So you can hit record and then run through your PowerPoint slide deck as you normally would. At the end, Camtasia will ask you what you'd like to do with your project. You can either stop the recording here at the end of your slide deck or continue to record. If you choose to stop recording, it'll prompt you to save it and then you can bring that project right into Camtasia so that you can either produce your recording or edit it by using Camtasia's editing tools to enhance that presentation. If you have one of the latest releases of Camtasia, either Camtasia 9 or the newest one, Camtasia 2018, there's another way you can use your existing PowerPoint decks, and that is to simply import them into Camtasia as individual slides that you can then manipulate and enhance. This brings in your entire PowerPoint slide deck as individual slides that you can then add to your timeline one at a time and use some of Camtasia's annotation tools or animations to add a visual pop. You can also use the voice narration tool to voice over individual parts of your presentation without having to record the whole thing at once. So I would see a lot of benefits in you being able to import your PowerPoints. Let me quickly note that he did mention you could add on effects to your slides. So things like transitions are would be especially useful. Fading from one PowerPoint to another or fading through black or wipe effects or all kinds of different things you can do. Once you're happy with your video presentation, you can either upload it to your personal website that's going to be, maybe for some of you, you have a virtual drive and you can drop all the files into a virtual drive. Or maybe some had mentioned using eCampus. Um, you might find some limitations with eCampus, but uh, if you decide to go that way, that, that might work for you as well. So let me show you, if you decide to go that way, you click Share to the top right and go to Local File. And then this is asking where I want to save this, this um, video. And by default, MP4 should be selected. You can change that, but I don't recommend it. What I do recommend is exporting as a web page because Camtasia, um, the TechSmith video player is actually quite good. So if you end up wanting to put this video on your site, you need some way to play it for people to, to where they don't have to download your video. It'll just automatically play once they go to, the, go to a link for the video. So if you export as a web page, it should actually include the HTML needed to play your video for them. So have that selected and let's go to export. Depending on what you're exporting here, um, it may take some time since I'm using 4K resolution. This is actually taking um, a couple minutes, but uh, computer processing power can really speed this up as well. So once it's done, I just want to go see what it packaged up for me. I'm going to drag this window over here. You can see my getting started project has given me an index.html and a media folder. In that media folder is kind of where the magic is happening 
for the video player. It's given me my uh, graphics for the video, my uh, index player.html, which is the player itself, the code to make this video play. And then my mp4 file is the actual video that I created. In order to make this a page, you would just upload everything keeping this media folder alongside the index.html. And then essentially once people did go to your index.html, and you could rename this, but if people did go to your index.html, there would be a video waiting for them to play. So the other way to do that um, sharing of a video is to use YouTube, which is what I recommend because YouTube has unlimited storage, they have automatic closed captioning, and the video player is quite good. Um, you can play videos on a very slow internet connection, uh, whereas you might run into issues with that um, on TechSmith's video player. So to do that, Again, you go to share at the top right and go to YouTube. It wants me to sign in. Um, actually, I'm already signed in, so it skipped that step. But you sign in with your TAMU address, Google account, and then it wants me to name the project, assign some tags and a description. And a cool option here is you could, it, I think by default it would be on public, but you can actually change it to unlisted. And what that means is your video would not be searchable by just the general public. They would the only way for people to see at that point is either if you link it on your website or if they have a direct link to the video on YouTube. So yes, essentially people could share that video URL, but um, that that is something to keep in mind. So once you're happy with that, you share it. Again, it needs to export the movie. Um, this time it's actually compressing it for YouTube instead of for uh, as a web page. So it might be a little bit faster. Now what's neat is it's provided me uh, the video URL that it's been put on YouTube and then an embed code as well. So I don't have to actually go to YouTube to retrieve this information. So you can copy it and now an example use of using that would be you go to your page on eCampus or your virtual drive and you could insert that embed code on an HTML page and it would have the video right there on the page and people could play it without having to be redirected to YouTube. And so that's pretty much it. Another thing I should mention about YouTube is you could upload all the videos you want to it and you could actually share access to your YouTube channel with a student worker. So if you wanted a student worker to come in after the fact and come and edit all your closed captioning and make them perfect, basically, then you could do that with uh, multiple students, really, and just ask them all to get in there and fix all your closed captioning. You might want that because the closed captioning is not perfect with YouTube, though it is quite good. There might be some words that come out as jargon or just it doesn't pick up anything because maybe your microphone got disconnected or muffled at some point. So that's pretty much it. Camtasia is very useful based on how you're using it. I hope this video helps you and good luck.